Welcome to On the Line, the show that connects you to Vice News. This week, although the guns are silent, North and South Korea are still at war. Seeking to break Pyongyang's hold on the media, activists in South Korea are using helium balloons to send money and propaganda into the North. I swear to God if I fucking end up in Pyongyang. Michael Moynihan traveled to South Korea to witness a clandestine launch and investigate Korea's controversial information war. Now, live from Brooklyn, Michael is on the line. Hi, I'm Michael Moynihan, a sometimes correspondent for Vice News. And this week, uh, we launched a new documentary um, called Propaganda Over Pyongyang. And the documentary documents balloon launches done by South Korean defectors who are trying to send, or North Korean defectors, trying to send material into the North, which is a closed off society and has no access to the information that you and I have. So they send USB drives and propaganda. And we made a film about it. One of those things that they were supposed to send was the James Franco film, The Interview. Uh, They didn't end up sending it, but uh, you can watch the documentary and find out why. So I'm ready to take your questions, your criticisms, so let's have at it. Okay. Hey, Michael. So first up today, we have uh, Torin calling us from Atlanta, Georgia. Let's go ahead and say hello to Torin. Torin, hi. Hey, how are you? Good. What do you got for me? Okay, my question is, what would be the risk of these balloons being found by North Korean um, citizens? What would be the risk to their lives if they were caught with any of these things? Yeah, you know, it's a really complicated question because, I mean, one of the things that is very, very difficult about reporting about North Korea is you get, I mean, it, it is so sealed off from the outside world. This, the, the stuff that trickles out is often contradictory. I mean, often, some, I mean, sometimes it's, it's inflammatory for particular reasons, for political reasons. But, you know, when we were there, we talked to a number of people that had a number of different ideas about this. So we saw a video, and this is, this is in the film, we show this video in the film, of someone being executed publicly in North Korea. Not an uncommon occurrence, unfortunately, in North Korea. The guy who had this film, uh, who was a defector himself, said that the crime, and I put that in sort of air quotes, the crime might have been one of two things. One was stealing copper wire. In po- impoverished country, you steal this wire and you sell it on the black market. The other might have been watching South Korean soap operas, the act of watching it. Now, we talked to other people, too, who said, you know, this is not only frowned upon, but you will go to a labor camp if you are caught watching this stuff. It's, and this person told us that the biggest, you know, offense was distributing this stuff. Smuggling the stuff in, selling the stuff in the black market, that was the stuff that got you in front of a firing squad. But, you know, again, it's, it's really, really tough to, f- to figure this out. Another guy we have in the film is this guy, uh, uh, Mr. Lim, who is a defector. He defected in the early 1990s after a mad plan to assassinate Kim Il-sung. What he told us was that if you have stuff that's particularly insulting to the Kim family, you know, the crime family that runs uh, North Korea, that's a special type of thing. So if you have that, and he makes makes this dramatic kind of motion in the film where he does the sort of hand across the throat, you're going to get get uh, killed for this. You're going to be, be executed, fake drumhead court, and you'll be shot. Whereas, you know, if you have a Hollywood film, a South Korean soap opera, the punishment might be different. The important point to note here is that there is punishment no matter what for having this stuff, for having illegal, uh, you know, DVD players. And these DVD players have USB drives on them, so people can smuggle in lots and lots of uh, uh, videos on these USB drives. So they watch them under the cover of dark and under covers themselves, actually putting blankets over their heads. Somebody told us about this. Um, You know, the penalties vary because there is no court system in any sort of sense that we would understand it, that there is a codified penalty for this. So execution, yes. Um, imprisonment, but always punishment. There'll always be punishment. Finding this stuff is a slightly different thing. There's people who can find this stuff and alert the authorities and not, not touch it. This rarely happens. Um, and you know, we, we talked to a number of people that actually did find this stuff when they lived in North Korea and you know, took it with them and took their chances. Okay. 
anything else? Anything else? Any other pressing issues uh, that uh, you wanted to ask me about? No, I was just curious about what the risk would be to like an average North Korean citizen because I got the idea that, you know, the people who are doing this from the South Korean side, even though they might be defectors, they may not realize the risk that they're taking, they're putting other people's lives in by sending this stuff over there. That's all. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very fair point. And it's, and it's one that I tried to address with a number of people. And so in the film, we have not just this kind of, you know, picturesque thing where everybody's happy and, and everybody thinks sending balloons to the north is a, is a terrific idea. That is actually not the case at all. And when I ask people why this was such a divisive issue, it, it, it spans, you know, the, and this is spanning the ideological spectrum too. There was a number of different reasons for this. One of the big ones was the risk that came to people. And there were others that said, look, you know, th th this is always the risk of getting information into a total totalitarian society, and this is a risk that a lot of pe people are willing to take. Um, so, you know, there's a number of reasons why people are skeptical of balloon launches, and that's one of them. So I, I very much appreciate your question. Thanks. All right. So, hey, uh, we've got Daniel on Skype now. Uh, Daniel is calling us from Sacramento. So let's say hey. Daniel hey, in Sacramento. You're an enormous fan of the European Union, I see. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in general, I like Europe. European Union, I've been back and forth on. All right. it. We have a Euro skeptic caller from Sacramento. <laughs> What's your yeah, question? Pretty much. Um, my question is: At Parker's press conference, did the counter demonstrators actually have like reasons in the platform, or do you think that they were influenced by North Korea? Ah, uh, yeah. This is a this is a tricky one. I mean, and when you're doing a film like this, you have to use, um, and this is the sort of obvious trick of the trade, you have to use some weasel words in it. We, I mean, there's no way for us to know. A lot of people told, told us that these guys are North Korean stooges. There's one thing I, I, I do mention in the voiceover of the film is that the, the South Korean, uh, uh, American ambassador to South Korea, Mark Lippert, was attacked a couple of weeks ago with a razor blade, face slashed, wrist slashed, the guy who uh, was tackled and uh, was the perpetrator of this essentially attempted assassination uh, was one of the guys that was protesting the balloon launches. He was protesting the Human Rights Foundation. So we get a little bit more of a look into what his motivations are because there's a focus on him and the South Korean government is investigating him. We find out that in the past 10 years or eight years or something, uh, he had been to Pyongyang seven times. That's a pretty curious thing. I mean, in keeping in mind in South Korea, that trip is illegal. There's something called the national security law in, in, in South Korea that, you know, because the two countries are still technically at war, it prevents people from, it's a, a horrible law, by the way, agitating on behalf of the North. And so this is a law that they use against people who are, you know, sort of pro-Kim, far left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we couldn't get a good sense of what they were there for. So, you know, we went and talked to them, obviously. The answers didn't strike any of us as being straightforward and honest. They said that, you know, it increases tensions. We don't want any border clashes. We don't want the North Koreans to fire into the South. We don't need this right now. And one guy says, and it's a great quote, we don't need sort of unfettered uh, free speech at this point. And you know, we actually have a clip of that from, from the piece, uh, and it's, it's the, uh, one of these protesters uh, telling me what his reasons were for protesting. So let's take a look at that. What is the reason that you come out to protest Park Sinhok? So I think that, you know, um, there's a bit of radical politics involved in here. I mean, he says a couple of things. One is that, you know, uh, this is U.S. influence and U.S. money. And obviously, it's a bit of a tense issue since 1953 and American troop presence in, in South Korea. And there's a kind of a instinctual anti-imperialist bit there. And the other thing that I found fascinating is that, you know, he says this is not the time for, quote, and this is his quote, unlimited free speech. Now, there have been in a state of war since 1953, technically. So th this is 60 plus years of not a time for free speech. Interestingly, right after that, I talked to one of the women that was a defector who attacked 
physically attacked, it's shown in the film, physically attacked and tore up the sign of these protesters. And I said to her, I said, look, you came from a society where there is one opinion and one opinion allowed. Don't you believe in free speech? And I got much the same answer, which is very, very frustrating. She said, well, you know, I, I believe in free speech, but they're saying things that aren't true. And that's the point of free speech. So, so that's, uh, you know, maybe an exhaustive answer to, uh, to, a, well, to a complicated question, actually. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Cool, man. So, hey, we got a video message. Uh, on we do? Skype, actually, from okay. Dimitri. Let's uh, take a listen to this. Dimitri. Let's go, Dimitri. Hello. My name is Dimitri, and I'm from El Paso, Texas. My question is, do you personally think that this is an effective form of protest and that it actually helps North Koreans to understand the Western way of life? Or do you think that this is unnecessary and that this can destabilize the region? Thank you. Well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I think that there's... Anything can technically destabilize the region when you have a psychopathic regime uh, in Pyongyang, as you do. Um, is it effective? Well, there's a lot of difference of opinion on this. Um, you know, a, a couple of things. First, you know, I, we'll go to a clip here because we talked to um, a guy who was not only tasked with shooting down these balloons, um, he was in the uh, North Korean military in the 90s. And, and keep in mind, this was a time when it was the South Korean government that was doing this. It was in private organizations. It was the South Korean government. And they were shooting these things down. And when you shoot them down, the stuff falls on the ground. And you pick it up. And he picked it up. So let's see what he said about it. <laughs> 장군들도 좋아해. <laughs> 그래가지고 야, 보고 좋다. 남조선아, 감나 새끼들이 야 예쁘다 야 하면서 그러는 거야. <laughs> so these balloons and these drops were pretty helpful in spreading information, giving you food and you mm. know dirty pictures, and it was like you know that made you in some way want to go to the south, correct? 그걸 보면은 남한에 대한 그 적대감이 많이 없어져. 그런데 단 하나 위험한 게 있어요. 김일성이나 김정일을 욕하거나 노동당을 비난하거나 이런 전단이 오면은 그거는 달라지는 거야. 그거는 가지고 있으면은 무조건 꽥 돼지는 거야. Uh, now keep in mind this this guy Mr. Lim who you see later um, after the scene uh, tells us that he was planning an armed incursion into, and it was broken up by the South, the South Korean and, and Chinese government. So this is not a guy who's a softy in any way, but he has a nuanced take on this. Very, very inflammatory stuff, like the interview, for instance, um, that attacks the Kim regime, the Kim family, is strictly forbidden. I mean, this is a bad idea from his perspective because it puts people in danger. On the other hand, he says, you know, look, it softened my attitudes uh, towards what the South was. I mean, this is a, a, a sort of single party state, one television channel, uh, one, essentially one newspaper, um, giving bombastic, insane information that is not true, about, especially about the South and about the US. So another defector we met, and we didn't use this, um, he said to us, I, I asked him, I said, what are you guys sending in in these, D, these uh, USB uh, drives, films, soap operas, the rest of it? And he said, no, I have been filming inside a South Korean supermarket, just walking through with a camera, filming South Korean supermarkets, putting that as an AVI file or whatever it might be onto a thumb drive and smuggling, this was not balloons, smuggling it in over the Chinese border. It was important for them, because these are people that, that, that were North Koreans, to understand what was actually happening in the South. That it wasn't this idea that this place was full of poverty and penury and you know, oppression. Um, so it, and I think in that way, exposing people to that sort of information is very important, very effective. Is it effective via balloon? It's hard to tell, but, but I, I, I tend to doubt it slightly. So hey, we have somebody else, right? Yeah, we, we, yes, I hope guess? so. How'd you guess? Because uh, we're, on, we're on television? Is that why? That's a good clue. <laughs> uh, so next we have uh, Jeff. Jeff's calling us from South Korea, actually, you know, speaking of. Jeff South is Korea. in South Korea. Jeff is a journalist yeah. in South Korea, aren't you, Jeff? I am, actually, yes. And by the way, cool documentary. I thought that was great. It was a lot of fun to watch. But I Thank do you. have one question for you, Michael. Sure. So um, you, uh, you did all this work. You came to South Korea. You went out to the balloon drops, and then it turned out that actually the interview was not in the balloons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how did you feel about that? <laughs> 
Oh, you're gonna make me say things about my lovely hosts who were very kind uh, enough to allow us to tag along. Um, it was really um, disappointing in one way um, because we weren't told about this. And what ended up happening, and this was reported in the South Korean media, and I talked to Park sang Hak about it, who's, who's the guy that's launching these balloons, in the most kind of frenetic defector, most vocal, very, very divisive uh, in the de defector community. Um, he, there was some intervention um, from the South, South Korean government and the Ministry of uh, Unification or Reunification uh, had beseeched him to not include this because it was you know, a tense moment. And it's shocked me actually that Park, who is like, just does not back down on anything, actually backed down. But what happened was right afterwards, the next day at this uh, press conference, and we show this in the film, he threatens them again and says, okay, you gotta play ball now because we're gonna come back to you with Seth Rogen, which is kind of comic in a way when you're watching this, that said, you know, I gave you a reprieve this time, but next time, James Franco, this is what's gonna happen to you. So he's, as you know, I'm, I'm sure he announced recently that he's going to, to do a balloon launch soon with, with the interview, but you know, it was really difficult for us because no one told us. We got there on Monday. We were told the balloon launch was gonna be later in the week. And then, you know, bleary-eyed and, and, you know, jet-lagged, we're about to go back to the hotel and they say, okay, we're driving north uh, to Paju and we're going to launch the balloons tonight. So it just hit us like, wow, there's the, the banner of the interview. And then the next day we find out that they're not in there. And just, by the way, from a technical perspective, the entire time I'm sitting there talking to the camera like, wow, we're sending the interview into North Korea. Um, but we weren't, and that's uh, because uh, Park, uh, I think he was pressured in some way into, into not doing it, but he's, he's he apparently gonna do it now. And did you, I thought you, did you have a follow-up question? Did you know? I do, actually. Yeah, I do, no, it's yeah. fine. It's fine, let's just, let's make okay, this okay. like a Kurosawa so, but, movie. We'll go all okay. day. So it's, okay, so here's the thing I was, I was curious about. Um, you know, uh, I've interviewed a lot of North Korean defectors, too. And uh, they, they do say a lot of things about either balloon drops or, or, you know, DVDs going in the country. That's a really common strand that pops up yeah. here in Korea. And one of the things that I'd be curious to know about are, is your opinion on, you know, when these balloons are going over, you know, I can't help but notice that the, the, the cartoon of Kim Jong-un and the, the Korean language that they put on there, it, it's pretty aggressive. I mean, that's the, that's yeah. the feeling I get from it. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, does the average North Korean look at this and think, you know, oh, you know, my regime is evil, or do they think, yeah. oh, this is American propaganda, just like what, you know, our leader told us. It, I mean, and so, like, what, what kind of sense did you get? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, there were a lot of people, defectors um, and activists, who said this is a really bad idea, specifically with this film, because not only does the humor not translate, is that if you are born into this system, and you are schooled on, you know, this is the dear leader, the great leader, et cetera, they are deities, and no matter how sort of poorly they treat you, it still rattles them. And I had people tell me this, that you know, it rattles them to see the Kims mocked this way, despite the fact it's because of the Kim dictatorship that they left. There's another thing about this, that the effectiveness of North Korea's kind of ham-handed and lumbering propaganda, is it, it's much like a lot of studies that were done in, in Germany from 1933 to 1945, a lot of people said, you know, I don't think Der Fuhrer actually knows about this. And there's a number of interesting studies that people who think that the problems in North Korea are on a local level, and that, you know, if the dear leader, the great leader knew about this, it wouldn't be happening. So, you know, most of these people coming, you know, in the, the, sort of after the famine, et cetera, were economic migrants, they weren't political, you know, there's 25,000, 20, 25,000 defectors in South Korea, every single one of them seems to have a different opinion. There was, and this annoyed, greatly annoyed actually, uh, some of the activists. They said, you know, we cannot unite because Park is fighting with this other balloon launch guy who's a Christian. And it's just, it, it was so fractious that getting a handle on it was, they couldn't agree on anything. But there, was a, there were a lot of people who thought this was actually a very, very bad idea, particularly because of the film and because of the insulting message. So yeah, it's a good question. All right. Well, All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. Um, so, last person calling in for the day, we have uh, Suk Jung Hong calling us. Uh, she's in New York, actually. Uh, she's so in New York. Her. Yeah, she's in New York. Is she in the Hi. building? Hi, Suk Jung. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm actually not very far from Vice. Just come over. We can just do this. It's yeah. easier, you know? Exactly. Yep. 
Um, so I wanted to ask, um, as you just mentioned, the defector community is not monolithic and is quite divided, actually. And I, um, to me, it seemed like your documentary really focused on a group of defectors who are really intent on kind of regime collapse mm -hmm. or at least regime change through violent means. And so um, I think for, for many people, including a lot of Korean Americans, they fear that regime collapse actually is not going to have um, really... Uh, helpful consequences for ordinary North Koreans. And so I wanted to ask if, you know, if we, you know, for example, if you look at Iraq or, or Afghanistan, you can see what regime collapse yeah. has brought there. So I was curious if you asked the defectors about their long-term vision for beyond the balloon launch, like what happens or who takes power if not Kim Jong-un? You know, does yeah. the U.S. Or does, South, or does South Korea have a role? That is an incredibly good question. I mean, it, 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 and you're right. I mean, at the, we sort of end the film with two people, who, one of whom tried um, to, to stage an armed insurrection in um, North Korea. And, you know, contextually, this is important that it was during the famine in the late 90s when, you know, upwards, the UN estimates almost 2 million people died during that famine. Absolutely gruesome stuff. Um, the other guy that we, we spoke to, um, his family has been imprisoned. Uh, I, th I believe his brother was publicly executed. And he says, you know, I'm willing to, if the conditions are right, go and, you know, do this. And it's really interesting the language he uses because he says, my country betrayed me. It's not a reunification message at all. The message is, these, are, th these people betrayed me and, you know, I am here. My family's there. So that's, it's a really interesting sort of way of phrasing it and the way that people talk about this stuff. As far as regime collapse, you know, it's such a good question because if you look at the numbers of how North Koreans integrate in South Korea once they've defected, it's horrible. I mean, they, they, there's discrimination against them, obviously. They're considered an other, they're othered the second they get in. The, I mean, there are classes that, 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 they, have, that they take, the South Korean government does, um, to prepare them for what you and I would take, a, take for granted. You know, the fact that you can take a subway and that is modern and, you know, that, that grocery stores are full of food, that, you know, you can openly debate politics, that there's, you know, this sort of crazy energy on South Korean television of different opinions. That is very, very difficult for a lot of people. And you see that in the numbers and how poorly people have fared, North Koreans have fared. And, you know, this is what happens in most uh, regimes that collapse and try to uh, reintegrate. And the good example of this is East Germany and West Germany. To this day, 25 years after the fall of the wall, you literally have a, a massive disparity between how uh, East Germans uh, live their lives and how West Germans or former East and former West. And the wage disparity is enormous. How this would play out is totally beyond anyone. And I think that it's important to remember that this is not just a dictatorship. This is a country that ranks 165 out of 165 countries in freedom indexes all across the board. These are people that have been so brutalized by the Kim dynasty crime family, that reintegration is, I mean, I hope we get to the point where it's gonna be hard for them because it, this is worse. So I hope we get to the point where that has to be figured out. But it's, you know, people are, there's an entire a ministry in South Korea, the Ministry of Reunification, which uh, deals with these questions. So they're preparing for it. Yes, um, I guess, you know, as a follow-up, I'm curious because um, when you speak about the uh, the interview yeah. and uh, this idea that the Human Rights Foundation has, as well as Mr. Park, to send the movie as a destabilizing influence, um, I guess I've read defectors who say that this film is actually kind of demeaning to North Korean people. And yeah. it's, it's hard for me to, you know, see, for example, the counter protesters who are saying, you know, Human Rights Foundation of Korea as just, you know, simply pro North stooges, because in a way they are saying, well, the U.S. is technically at war with North Korea. Why are they funding these kinds of actions and activities, if not as an act of war? And so um, for it's kind of a question around the effectiveness of the interview and whether mm -hmm. you really feel or the defectors 
that you spoke to actually felt that it would do very much in North some South. some of them did you know and it's a, it's it's an interesting question and it's an open question about you know how effective this is to the point of a, of american funding most of the, dis the dissidents, they are dissidents, but uh, defectors we talked to were very, very um, upset with the State Department because most of their funding had been cut. We went to a radio station, we showed it very briefly, that used to be underwritten by the US government for many, many years and all their funding has been cut. So uh, Human Rights Foundation, a number of other groups are private people. So I think there's oftentimes a conflation of these private groups um, with the US government. Um, wh whether or not, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing for them because a lot of um, defector groups don't want an association, despite the fact that it is a fairly clean association. I mean, there, it's, everything's fairly transparent. It's not government funded. There are people, a lot of them are Christian groups, obviously. Um, we were with somebody who was a, a Korean American uh, activist who was Christian. Um, but at the same time, it gives them, uh, I wouldn't say a bad look, but they, they do have to fight against this perception that they, the, the protesters on one side are stooges of the North Koreans, and the balloon launch guys are stooges of Washington. Um, it's, I, I know the fact that, that the, 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 they're not stooges of Washington for, for many complicated reasons. The other ones, I, I, it's, it's hard to tell, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, I, I appreciate your question. Okay, Michael. So, hey, I, I kind of lied to you when I told you that was the last thing. You did? Some, yeah, I'm sorry, but not that sorry. I gotta sorry. go. Um, we, got, we got this really great tweet from Arturo while we were live. Um, Arturo wants to know if uh, we're entering a new era of propaganda, oh. and he's looking at everything uh, from your documentary with the, yeah. the information war, and yeah. specifically ISIS. So, what do you think about that? Well, Should I hope that? he's not comparing our documentary to ISIS, but um, <laughs> no, I think he's right. I mean, it's... A, it's ISIS is a, is a great example of this, to see how people with cheap cameras and you know, cheap software and an internet connection, even in a war-ravaged place like Syria, can make incredibly slick productions that are actually luring people. And we see the number of young people that are coming from Europe into, into Syria and parts of ISIS-controlled Iraq, and you see that this stuff is very, very effective. Everybody we talked to um, that was a defector said that, that some experience with the outside world and outside media affected them. There's one woman named Yunmi Park who said that it was Titanic and friends that said, wait, there's a different world out there. They've been lying to me. So it does have that effect. In, you know it has an effect, by the way, when the North Korean regime goes to such great lengths to seal up that country. It's hermetically sealed. And there is an internet, which is, I think, accessible to 4,000 people, and that's actually an intranet. There's no access to any information. One of the interesting things about these USB drives, uh, not mentioned in, in most of the media coverage, uh, is the USB drives come with offline versions of Korean Wikipedia. It's not propaganda as such, but the truth is propaganda to Pyongyang. So people can browse these things on certain devices that have uh, information that they ordinarily wouldn't get. So, you know, propaganda is something that has always existed. I think that in, it's a new era in the sense that the technology, we can actually crack uh, North Korea. I mean, sending balloons over, but you're sending balloons over of much more uh, explosive and inflammatory stuff like South Korean soap operas. I mean, that might be what brings the regime down. Well, you know, with that, uh, we've reached the end of the show. We have. Yeah, it's uh, oh, that was fun. been so short. Okay. Um, well, you know, I thank uh, all of you for your questions, and I uh, thank you for uh, watching our piece. There'll be many more of them, so uh, keep coming back to Vice News. Thanks. This is your uniform. Does, it, does, it, does your uh, hat uh, still uh, fit? Uh, uh, does it still fit? Uh, uh. Oh, God, you're terrifying right now. I'm scared right now. Give them the law. No, don't. Uh. Seriously, don't. <laughs> Dude, literally, he's playing North Korean television. He's wearing the hat. He's threatening me. This is going to be an international incident right now. So let's let's, let's go invade the South.